Hello, Facebook. I'm Evan Dushevsky, Features Editor with PC Mag. Welcome to The Convo. This is the show where we talk to the boldest, smartest, best names in science, technology, and geekdom to talk about the big things that are coming our way. So I've got bad news and good news. Let's start with the bad news. Uh, robots are coming to take your job. Uh, the good news is that robots are coming to take your job, so you don't have to do them. Now, in theory, in theory, um, machines and automation taking over production will lower the cost of everything and make it possible for us not to have a job. So it's a wash, right? Um, well, there's a little bit more. The, there's a little bit more bad news uh, in that as we get towards that sort of place, there's going to be a lot of political and social upheaval. It's going to be some bad times, some of which might be starting right now. It's possible. Um, but then the good news is I have my guest Ryan Event, or Avent, um, who is here to, to explain it to us. Now, Ryan is a columnist and senior editor with The Economist. His work has appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New Republic, The Atlantic, and The Guardian. Fancy. Yeah. Okay. And his new book is called The Wealth of Humans. Now, it's out this week, and he talks about the possible coming storm. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Okay, so now, oh, and I should also mention that we want you to join in the conversation. If you have any questions about technology, robots, automation, about economics, drop them in and uh, Social Pete, who is not a robot, and we would never replace with a robot even if we could. He'll read them off later in the show. So did I summarize your book correctly? Exactly how screwed are we? Uh, well, no, you did. It's, okay. There's good news and there's bad news. I think, you know, to, to some extent we're screwed, but if we can figure out how to manage the tech technical change, mm -hmm. uh, then over the long run, we ought to be, I and mean, this is how we become much richer. We come up with new gadgets that can do things that, that used to take a lot of human labor or horse labor, mm -hmm. and that's you know the way we become richer and, and happier. I mean, the, the, the rub is that we've got all these institutions that are designed for a world in which everyone goes out and works 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. uh, and if that's not going to be possible, uh, then we have to come up with something new, and mm -hmm. that process is going to be very messy. Mm -hmm. Now, people have been talking about what has been referred to as technological unemployment since the 30s. Uh, it's got a lot more attention I found in like the last decade or so. Um, what's changing? Why are people talking about it now? I think it's a few things. I think it's uh, partly the fact that uh, new technology has, has uh, proceeded to get better a lot faster than we thought it would. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years ago, people thought it would be ages until uh, computers could drive cars. But mm -hmm. now, uh, now we're seeing that on, on, on actual streets. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, um, life has been difficult for a lot of workers. Mm -hmm. uh, wages haven't been growing like we would like them to. Um, the, the growth rates across the economy have been pretty slow. And so the combination of the two, I think, is waking people up to the, the fact that there might be something really dramatic going on. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people I've talked to who like, are futurists or technologists, they see that this could be a problem, but decades down the line, 30, 40 years. Now, I've heard you say that you think that some of the um, problems that could be resulting from this sort of uh, uh, paradigm are actually being shown now in 2016. Well, what kind of things do you, do you see happening and what makes you think that? Yeah. I mean, so yeah. the, the age when there's mass unemployment and the mm -hmm. robots are doing all the jobs, I think is decades down the mm -hmm. line. We're, we're not on the, on the brink of that, but mm -hmm. we are in a world where technology is allowing uh, lots of, of, of workers around the globe to join the la global labor market, and mm -hmm. that's sort of depressing wages. Uh, there is some automation happening in, in factories and increasingly in the service sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, technology also allows some high-skilled workers to do a lot more than they, they could in the past. And the, the kind of net effect is just uh, what I call an abundance of labor, a glut of mm -hmm. labor that's depressing wages and causing lots of social difficulties. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're saying that automation can cause, to say, some of the populist movements that we've seen because that's kind of from uh, workers who have not been able to... Mm -hmm. uh, ...from automation. They have to go out and find another... Uh, even if it doesn't pay very well. Mm -hmm. They're obviously not happy with that. We see inequality widen as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, and people begin to look for scapegoats. They, they you know, blame people uh, who have migrated from other countries. And um, I, you know, I think it's not a surprise that we've seen you know, anti-immigrant sentiment and kind of political upheaval in lots mm -hmm. of different countries. Now, let's talk about some of the reactions that society should have. Now, a lot of people are talking about the universal basic income, UBI. Um, some people are talking about a four-day work week, which I would love. That sounds, um, sounds yeah. good. Uh, what do you think about these solutions or any other words? Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I think they're all thinking in the right way, mm -hmm. which is that um, eventually we're going to need to, to change the way we do things so mm -hmm. that people are working less uh, and are also able to continue to buy the things they need. And mm -hmm. so that's where redistribution or the basic income comes into the picture. I mean, there's a, a couple difficulties, though. Uh, one is that um, 
people don't necessarily want to live in a world without work. I mean, even if we think work is a drag, it kind of creates structure for our day. Mm -hmm. It gives us purpose and meaning. And so um, you can imagine society would be kind of a messy place if no one ever had to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part that, that's kind of tricky is that you have to come up with a way to, to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means you have to tax somebody uh, or, or create common ownership, uh, uh, something that's going to require uh, a big political change. Mm -hmm. And getting to that point is going to be, uh, it, it tends to take a while and tends to have a lot of kind of uh, mess alongside it. Well, talk about the idea that we want people to have jobs. Now, uh, we had Douglas Rushkoff, the media theorist, in here mm -hmm. a few months ago. Smart dude, a lot of energy. Um, so he came in here, he's a bit of a techno-optimist, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, so he was saying that, like, you know, we shouldn't be getting people towards work, towards jobs. Or he, he differs between the definition of a job and work. He said that, like, that's not the goal. The goal should be to create this kind of new idealist society. Now, it's, I'm sure you've heard a lot of these, like, techno-optimists who mm -hmm. want the Star Trek economy. Do you think that's achievable, or like in our lifetime, or uh, in our uh, lifetime? No, well, it would no. be great. Okay. It would be, be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't. I mean, uh, some aspects of the Star Trek economy possibly are achievable yeah. in the sense that you know we can create uh, a lot of, uh, of goods at low cost, mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that you know we can, that people don't need to work so hard to. Uh, to, to have them. Mm -hmm. We see that especially now with mm -hmm. things like media, uh, which you used to have to pay a lot to mm -hmm. have an encyclopedia or um, to get your film developed, and now those things are, are essentially free. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually that may you know, come to more and more physical goods mm -hmm. uh, and possibly even services. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, the idea that uh, we might all be motivated to go boldly where no man has gone you know, before, mm -hmm. and, and that will be the thing that motivates us, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, that, that does seem a little bit like science fiction. Uh, Facebook, I see you have a question. What job is least susceptible to being taken over by robots? Journalist. <laughs> yes, I, I wish. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I mean, so the that, that's the funny thing is that there are computer programs yeah. now out there that increasingly do the work that, that journalists used to do. Um, mm -hmm. Man, that's a good question. I think, you know, uh, there's a growing category of jobs that um, the sort of the value of those jobs is, is due to the fact that they're done by humans rather mm -hmm. than people. And so, you know, you don't want an artisanal... Uh, uh, cheese wheel that was made by a machine that sort of defeats the purpose mm -hmm. and I think you know we can expect to see this category grow um, and that that also includes things like physical therapy and uh, uh, and uh, counseling and other things like that um, the question is um, are those things really as susceptible as mm -hmm. we might hope I mean, you can imagine a really clever AI being uh, being a perfectly suitable counselor mm -hmm. uh, so um, I don't know I think uh, I guess if I had to say I would say um, Theater actor, actually, probably. Yeah. Because well, they have CGI for for Hollywood at least. Oh, yeah. True. When you think theater, you mean like that's alive, true. but they have holograms now yeah. too. No, Nothing. I mean, it's, We're all screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Yeah. Um, now I have a three-year-old at home. Not a bottle of wine, but a little person. Um, I don't know. What advice would you give to like young parents trying to prepare a little person for a world of twenty years from now? I mean, I mean, it's it's hard to prepare because we don't know exactly what technologies will be popping. That's right. We yeah. don't know exactly what the skill sets are going to be that, that we need to have mastered. Uh, I mean, I think you know anyone who is capable of going and getting a you know a PhD in computer engineering probably will be okay. I don't think that's going to be something that um, that goes away uh, over the next few decades. But the skills that are going to be uh, applicable in a lot of different parts of the economy are actually softer skills. I think it's an ability to kind of uh, learn from others. Uh, to to uh, teach yourself new things, mm -hmm. uh, to get along in different cultural settings, mm -hmm. um, basically to to be adaptive and to and to be able to pick up new skills as they are, as they arrive. I mean that's useful now, mm -hmm. um, but in an environment where uh, there are new sectors and new jobs always being created, uh, it's critical I think to being successful. So for um, for the school for, and like the schools will have to you know prepare kids for this new future. I'm talking about the public schools, not even getting up to college where you kind of you know, choose what you're gonna, your career is gonna be like four years from then. For schools, I mean, like what should they be, probably be teaching coding, which they're starting to do, robotics. Um, but is there like, when you're talking about like these soft skills, yeah. should we actually be concentrating on, you know, having kids, you know, be all fluffy and friendly with each other? Should that be something that they should concentrate on? I mean, on? a bit, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think socialization is very important. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's, you know, actually learning material is not necessarily as important as learning how to learn, mm -hmm. uh, being able to kind of, teach yourself new things uh, and 
you know, that's, that's not something that school systems are focused on. They've been very kind of results oriented, test score oriented, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it is important to be able to do calculus and, and mm -hmm. things like that. But to also be able to kind of uh, look around and say, this is a question that I really ought to be able to answer and I'm gonna go figure out how to answer it. That, I mean, that's, if we can teach uh, children to do that, that's, mm -hmm. that's hugely important. Uh, just going back to the four day work week, let's not, let's not skip that over. Um, does it economically make sense? I think so. I mean, I think, it, you know, it's one of the things that, that the kind of book kind of looks at is the extent to which uh, employment has uh, has grown to to include lots of workers mm -hmm. simply because they need to work. Mm -hmm. So if I get laid off, I need a job. I have to put food on the table. Uh, I'm going to go do whatever uh, I can to find one, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't pay very much. Right. But when there are a lot of people willing to work at low wages, um, then firms can hire them to do things that aren't critical, that aren't especially productive. Mm -hmm. And so I think we are actually working at a lower level of productivity than we could otherwise. And mm -hmm. if we were able to allow people to cut back and not, not, you know, not need to work 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. um, there'd be more opportunities to use some of the new technologies we're discovering uh, to enhance productivity. So I, I, I don't think there's a trade-off there. Mm -hmm. Are there particular technologies which you're going to be, think are going to be most disruptive in you know, driverless cars, machine learning, things like that? It seems to me that machine learning is the, the thing that is, um, it's, it's what I call a general purpose, not just me that calls it, mm -hmm. economists in general call it, it's a general purpose technology, which means it can be used in all sorts of different settings. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, a program that can carry on a basic customer service conversation mm -hmm. uh, with someone, that can be used by banks, it can be used by um, you know, insurance companies, mm -hmm. by you know, in all different parts of the economy and, and potentially put quite a lot of jobs at risk. Mm -hmm. And it can do other things besides. It can uh, it can write basic reports, um, and so I think those kind of those those uh, those abilities are going to be the things that that suddenly sort of multiply and, mm -hmm. and expand out and take a lot of jobs in the next few de few decades. Excuse me, a few mm -hmm. decades. I mean, if we look at the problems we're looking at, um, when you said like you know a customer service could be a machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the idea of machines being able to recognize our voice has gotten so bad. We we're talking about Alexa right before we got here. You know, a few years ago, like a computer listening to your voice and translating it sucked. They've gotten really good the last few years, and they're only going to get better. So that kind of uh, interaction is going to become more replaceable, like more skills that humans could do before. Not so much anymore. Uh, Facebook, I see you have a question. Is machine learning research going to make our species extinct? How? Yes. And I, I certainly hope not. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, we can imagine that it would uh, get to the point where human labor is unnecessary. Uh, but that doesn't mean that humanity itself is unnecessary. And, you know, indeed, uh, it could, could make human life much more interesting and, uh, and, and richer, I think. Mm -hmm. And we would hope that it would do that. Um, the, the tricky thing is going to be negotiating that process of freeing people from the labor force. Because if you are running a company, um, you, you do, to some extent, want to make your workers extinct. And the fact that mm -hmm. it's convenient for you if you don't have to pay wages to people, uh, because then you get to collect all the profits. And so they want to do things like sleep. Or take right, vacations. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think I don't I don't see extinction from uh, machines uh, as being a near term threat. Maybe from something else, um, but uh, but there are difficulties to be associated with this. Mm -hmm. um, and just because I don't get a chance to talk to a lot of economics writers, mm -hmm. and it's in the news really, uh, Wells Fargo. Okay, so what's, <laughs> uh, this does not have anything to do with technology, but what's going on there? And feel free to use offensively dumbed down uh, explanation of what happened there. Well, uh, banks uh, want to make money. Yes. Um, and uh, it's, it's becoming harder to make money doing a lot of the kind of fancy trading that banks were doing in the years before the crisis. Mm -hmm. Wells Fargo is actually a really successful retail bank, which means mm -hmm. it has a lot of customers who just use Wells Fargo as their bank. Mm -hmm. What they did was decide that to make a lot of money off those customers, they were going to give those uh, consumers all kinds of accounts, whether or not they needed them. They were mm -hmm. going to say, you know, you got a checking account with this. You also need a savings account, a money market account, a credit card account, mm -hmm. um, you know, six mortgages and so on. In fact, they, they set a goal for uh, their tellers, uh, their employees to, to have eight accounts on average mm -hmm. for, for all, all their customers, which is way more than, than I have and I think mo more than most of us need. Mm -hmm. um, that, that in itself is kind of disconcerting. Right. But what they ended up doing in addition to that is, uh, is uh, you know, placing such strong incentives on their tellers uh, to create these accounts. Mm -hmm. The tellers were sort of coming up with, you know, people would come in, they say, do you want an extra account? The customer would say no, mm -hmm. but they would create one for that person anyway, which mm -hmm. is sort of basically fraudulent. And, right. and so that, that's, 
that's what's really gotten them into a lot of trouble. Do you think that uh, like and the higher ups, that the, the lower down guys should actually be punished for this, or do you think they will be? Do I think they will be? Yeah, no, no. The last ten years strongly suggest that that, uh, that they won't be. Uh -huh. I think, and uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren uh, was just grilling. She filled up my Facebook yesterday. She did. Yeah, she yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, she 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 let the the CEO of, of Wells Fargo have it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's about as, as bad as it will get for him. I could be I could be wrong, but mm -hmm. but I you know I would if he does lose his job, it will probably be with a, a very uh, a, a lovely and beautiful golden parachute. Good for him. Um, okay, so but back, back to technology. You know, we are a consumer technology place. Um, so just to, to give a round down, because people are actually interested in this sort of thing. Uh, so for home and work, are, are you Apple or PC? <laughs> uh, I'm Apple at home. Uh -huh. um, I am uh, PC at work. Okay. Not by choice. iOS or Android? iOS. iOS, okay, good for you. Um, <laughs> and then where do you get your daily news? You're an air journalist, so where do you get your daily news throughout the day? Well, I uh, am a subscriber to uh, New York Times and the Washington Post, mm -hmm. uh, and I usually uh, scan their, their sites uh, every morning. Mm -hmm. uh, when I get into the office, we have a bunch of periodicals laying around that I mm -hmm. usually scan. But I'm, um, I overwhelmingly get my news these days from, from Twitter, really. Mm -hmm. I have a, like a nice, um, nicely curated feed of, of journalists that I like from all different um, areas, and inevitably they're talking about the stuff that's really interesting, pointing, pe pointing me toward the stories that I you know, ought to be reading about that morning. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've got uh, I've got uh, uh, an RSS feed that, that that I use. I don't. Do people still use those? Uh, I mean, for like Feedly or things yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. they read them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm I, I still keep up with that, but mm -hmm. Twitter overwhelmingly is the source of most of my news. Uh, Facebook. So you have a question. How much do you think hackers will affect the stream of uh, upcoming technology implementation? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, the more we use computers uh, in our daily lives, mm -hmm. obviously the more places there are where hackers can uh, create trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, there are going to be a lot of vulnerabilities. I think probably the amount of fear that we have about what, what hackers can do is going to be more significant than the harm they can actually cause. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th everyone's kind of terrified about the idea of, of hackers hacking the entire driverless automobile fleet and doing mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Um, probably our fear of that is, 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 is overstated. Um, but it's something to take seriously. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, it's not encouraging when, you, when every other day you, you hear about a big, big new breach, mm -hmm. whether it's Yahoo this week and, and, and someone else in a couple of days, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's how much of that is, is due to people who are trying to actively cause trouble and how much of it is due to sort of state-sponsored actors mm -hmm. who are really just looking to, to scare, you know, basically playing Cold War games. Mm -hmm. um, that's not that encouraging, but you have to... Are you talking about one country in particular? I, you know, I'm yeah. not going to name any names because yeah, yeah. uh, they might, might uh, you know, come after my accounts. But, yeah. uh, you know, we lived uh, for most of the post-war period under the threat of nuclear war, and mm -hmm. that was really scary. Um, you know, it's possible we'll be have a new sort of Internet of Things Cold War. God, sure. that's really gloomy to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, oh, then, then actually let's do, what, was there a technological um, uh, uh, purchase that you've made in the last year that, you, that, you was, that you've liked the most? That I've liked the most. Yes. Um, or been most impressed about <laughs> Do you want, this is going to be super lame. Go for um, it, go for but it. But I, yeah. we, so we, uh, I, I just moved back from London actually, okay. and uh, we um, had a, a tiny television in London mm -hmm. um, because we didn't, you know, we weren't, uh, we weren't signed up for any TV there. Yeah. So we came back and we bought a massive flat screen TV and these things cost nothing these days yeah uh, and it was just a really uh, satisfying experience absolutely <laughs> I, you yeah, know yeah, it's kind know. of kind of simple but yeah. I you know I've yeah. I've been anxiously kind of watching the reviews for uh, uh, the new watch the watch yeah, series watch. 2 because yeah. uh, I had high hopes for it so. we thought it was I right. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, think, I, think, I think that might be yeah. the next big, big version. Yeah. Okay. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so just so you know, so he has the column at The Economist mm -hmm. uh, available online, and the name of the column is? Free Exchange. Free Exchange. And let, let's give you a plug. What was the column this week? Did... The column this week yeah. uh, was about this amazing new argument that this uh, famous economist called Paul Romer is making, mm -hmm. which basically says that all of macroeconomics uh, is not really science. I've been saying that all along. Yes. Yeah. No, a lot of people have. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 for an, a prominent economist to say it is, yeah, yeah. is quite a big deal. So okay. Uh, well, you can check that out if you're, you're interested in, in those sort of things. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone who participated at home. Uh, thank you to Social Pete. And you know, if you liked us, give us a like, give us a share. Check out some of our old episodes. We do a lot of these interviews. We'll do a lot more. Um, so and also, as always, be good to each other. Peace. Oh, and buy the book. Yes. <laughs>